Hi, everyone, um, and welcome to this latest installment of Masterclass Live. This is a new initiative of ours that we're testing out that allows members to connect directly with our wonderful instructors in an up close and personal format. Given the current climate, we're providing this normally members only benefit free to the public for the foreseeable future. For those of you new to Masterclass, welcome. We're an online learning platform that makes it available for anybody to learn from the absolute best. We currently have around 80 classes on our roster with instructors teaching who are at the absolute top of their game. Everyone from Sarah Blakely teaching entrepreneurship to Aaron Sorkin teaching screenwriting to Tim Bolin teaching producing and beat making. And of course, Chef Dominique Ansel, who joins us today. Dominique taught our first and currently only class on French baking and pastry, a class that I am very proud to say won a James Beard Award last year, which if you're keeping count makes that our first and Dominique's second. <laughs> He's also been named best pastry chef in the world by the world's 50 best, a culinary Van Gogh by Food and Wine Magazine and is bien sûr the creator of the Cronut, which aside from being a worldwide phenomenon, Time Magazine named one of the best inventions of 2013. And I agree. My name is Serena. I'm a senior creative producer at Masterclass and I had the distinct pleasure of overseeing Chef Dominique's class. It was my very first at the company. Chef, thank you for being here today. Uh, thank you, Serena. Thank you for the introduction. You almost made me blush. <laughs> almost, but not <laughs> quite. We'll see if we can get you there over the course of an hour. All right, sounds good. Um, so I have to confess that in recent weeks, I have had this newfound sweet tooth. I seem to be seeking sugar in a very different way right now. Um, and I know that I'm not alone. It feels like all of the travel photos that I normally see on Instagram have been replaced by pictures of sourdough and cakes. What mm. is it about baking and baked goods that people turn to in times of need? I think for me, it's uh, baking is very comforting. It's uh, for a lot of people, I, I often talk about their emotions when we talk about food, especially when we talk about sweets, uh, memories of childhood, uh, baking at home with your mom, with your grandma. And uh, one of the questions that I often ask people is what is the first thing you've ever done in the kitchen growing up? And 99% of people will tell me something. It's making cookies, baking a cake, uh, doing something simple with something comforting with your family, with your mother, with your grandma. And those are memories that sticks with you. And when it's time, you know, to, uh, to, to look for like those foundation, those memories, uh, baking is always something like very comforting for people. And how about for you? Is there a pastry or a dessert that you find yourself turning to time and again? Uh, this, this, Quite a bit. I recently made a video with uh, a yogurt cake, which is a French classic. Uh, I love baking, and I, you know, I, this is one of my first uh, memories as as a child, uh, making this yogurt her. cake with my mom uh, without a scale, just using the yogurt cup itself to actually measure out every uh, each of the ingredients. Uh, it's something that was like fascinated about. Something that was easy and simple, but at the same time, uh, something that was like really fun to do as a kid. So this was probably one, one of my earliest like baking memories as a child. And you just recently taught people on Instagram how to make it, right? That's right. That's right. Uh, you know, like a lot of you guys, we, we're stuck home. Uh, we have to we have to be at home and we have to be safe. And I think that you know, like me doing these videos of my memories and sharing with people what I can do, it's it's really fun. It's uh, it's simple. It's uh, uh, it's a delicious cake. Something that anyone can do. Uh, I'm doing a, a few a few more of these videos. That's a good way for me to stay, um, you know, socially connected with people, even from far away. Uh, we actually have a, a way to communicate together and share uh, share what we do and what we love. Well, and it fits with your philosophy, right? Which is that everyone can bake. It's the title of your new book, um, and it makes me wonder from like a from a personality or a demeanor perspective, what characteristics make for a good baker. I think there's a few for me. Uh, I was trained myself as a chef, a savory chef in the kitchen. So I've learned uh, how to cook, how to learn about ingredients, how to learn about vegetables and meat, how to season it, how to tweak the seasoning ba based on the quality of the ingredients you have. And when it came to baking, I've learned baking right after cooking. It was completely different for me. It was very precise. 
it was meticulous, scaling everything, measuring everything, uh, tamping everything with a thermometer. And it was a lot more scientific, a lot more uh, strict. And I like this because everything I will do in the kitchen using a scale will come out perfect. And uh, it's, it's also sweet, so it's also tastes good. It's a, a, a different approach, you know, when you work in the kitchen as a professional chef, there's, you know, the, the, the rush of the service, it's hectic, there's a lot to do, there's so many things going on. If you walk into the same kitchen with a pastry chef, it's actually quite calm, quite organized. Everyone knows exactly what they do. It's a little bit more uh, structure, I would say. To that end, that meticulousness and that precision can sometimes feel daunting to people. I know it feels a little daunting to me. Do you have any tips for people who are maybe equipped in the kitchen as savory chefs and are just sort of delving into pastry for the first time? What do they need to be remembering? Yeah, I think one of the most important things for me uh, is first to read, read the recipe from the beginning to the end. Read to understand where you're going and what you need. So make sure you have all your ingredients all your tools and equipment and uh, to make sure that you understand all the steps. You cannot skip any steps. You cannot fast forward. You cannot, there's no, uh, there's no trick to go a little faster. Pastry is science. Science is perfect and you have to follow each of the steps. That say, if you shouldn't be too scared or too worry about baking. Baking can also be simple. Uh, again, one of the first childhood memories will be baking for most people. And when you bake, there's always someone with you. Your mom, your grandma, they show you, they teach you each of the step, step by step. So I will say if you want to bake at home, first read the recipe from beginning to end, then make sure you have all your ingredients. And then thirdly, follow all the steps one at a time, measure everything, and everything will come out perfectly. And then number four, of course, is be patient. <laughs> Do you That's have right. any tips for developing patients if, like me, you have zero? Uh, not so much, no. <laughs> I, would say, I would say patience is important because, you know, like if you talk about fermentation in baking, for example, it takes a long time. It takes hours. Mm -hmm. You cannot bake it too early. You cannot wait too long either. You have to, it has to be the perfect timing. You have to wait for good things to happen within breads, within croissant, all those, like, molecules, like, interacting with each other making it so it's perfect at, at a certain time and that's important to be patient uh, because there's no there's no trick again it's uh, it's purely scientific and there's no no way to go around you have to be patient when you beg and uh, I'll say the more you do it the more you understand it and the more you appreciate all the work that goes into it you have to be patient in baking, and I suppose we should all be patient in life. So it's probably a good life skill to develop in the kitchen and then have it applied everywhere else. Exactly. Um, one of my favorite parts of the class, as you know, was when you analyzed the croissant cross-section pictures from your teams all over the world. Can you tell our viewers a little bit about that daily ritual? Yeah, of course. So we have a, a, a tradition and uh, something that we have to do every single morning. I have a few shops around the world and every single of my chef before they open the shop, they will do a, what we call a cross section. So they, they'll take a croissant uh, of each uh, special croissant. They will cut it in half and uh, they will take a photo of the inside. They will send me the photo so I can see the cross section. So this cross section essentially uh, defines the structure of the croissant, what it looks like from the crust from the outside, the coloration, it has to be golden and caramelized. All the little air pocket that we call the honeycomb uh, define the structure of the croissant. You can tell, I can tell just looking at it to see if it's light, if it's aerated, if it was fermented enough, if it was baked at the right temperature, and the thin uh, outline crust on the uh, outer of the croissant can tell me if it was put in the oven that was hot enough. So just like those, all these little details, I can actually quality check our product daily with our chefs around the world with just a photo. So that's, that's very important for me uh, to, to be able to stay connected. Uh, it's not just like the way it looks, but we have to look in the inside, look a little deeper and make sure that the consistency and the quality of what we refer to our guests, it's ultimately with it. And 
this may be beyond the cronut or the frozen s'more or the blossoming hot chocolate is really what makes you a master, I think. The fact that you can just look at a snapshot of a cross section of a croissant and immediately be able to tell if their oven was calibrated correctly, what's up with their honeycomb, if it didn't proof long enough. <laughs> I mean, that's astonishing. Yeah, it can get a bit like nerdy or a little bit more scientific. I'm just like talking about it very lightly right now, but uh, you know, bakers and uh, around the world are passionate about, we'd be passionate about what we do. It's very scientific. Again, it's uh, very specific and uh, it's a skill that, that takes a lifetime to learn. We're still nowadays uh, trying to master my croissant every day, trying to perfect it and try to make it the best in every single of our location. A lifelong journey of learning. Um, would you reveal which of your baking teams makes the best croissants? New York. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't tell you. They all they're all beautiful. Actually, Los Angeles has some very nice croissants, and uh, London. I have to, I have to say, London has some beautiful croissants as well. They use uh, French flour, French butter, and the quality of what they do is like really nice. We just opened a shop in Hong Kong as well, and uh, they do something very similar. So we use the same base recipe that we tweak uh, slightly based on the quality of the flour or the butter that we get in each of the location. But all across, they, they, they all do a great job, honestly. That's kind of you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, we were inspired by this and we thought that it would be fun to give our members a chance to submit photos of their goods and have you analyze them much like you do with your teams across the world. Are you up for looking at a few? Sure, I'll try to be not too tough. <laughs> you know what? That is entirely your prerogative. Um, by the way, uh, for anyone whose picture is shown today or question is asked, um, they will receive a copy of Chef Dominique's new cookbook, Everyone Can Bake. Very exciting. Um, okay, so since we were just talking about croissants, let's start with a croissant submission. This is from Chelsea. And she says, uh, when I tried making your famous croissants, they came out tasting like croissants from a can. As you can see, the internal <laughs> layers, the internal layers aren't the best. What might have gone wrong here? So what's your assessment, Chef? So it's, it's a little tough to say. Uh, it can be like hundreds of different things that, that can go wrong. Uh, just looking at it, uh, you know, I can tell like she shaped it like a croissant. I can see there's some layers. Uh, the dough is very dense, almost like doughy. I will say that uh, she might have used maybe the wrong flour or not. The appropriate flour for this. You cannot just use uh, an all-purpose flour. You have to use a baking flour or a flour that has a little bit more higher uh, gluten content, uh, something that that makes it a little bit more elastic. So it is like crush together the butter and the dough. So it looks a little bit doughy right now. Uh, I would have ferment this dough a little bit longer probably. It's uh, it's hard to tell just uh, with this one photo. Uh, we have to see all the ingredients. The flour and the butter are two of the most important ingredients for the croissant. And you have to make sure that uh, you, do, you do a good layering and that the dough is elastic enough, but not too much. So there's a separation between each of the layer of the butter and the dough. Is that how then you end up with that beautiful sort of airy honeycomb? Yeah, exactly. So there's like hundreds and hundreds of layer of dough on butter once you're done with the lamination, which is the technique of folding the dough on itself. And all, all these like hundreds of layers, when they ferment, they, they actually expand a little bit. And when they bake, they expand even, even, even a little bit more. And they form these like tiny hundreds of air pocket that we call the honeycomb, because when you cut it in half, it should look like a honeycomb, which this one doesn't. And that tells me that the dough was, it looks a little bit too dense. Or it could be that this dough was a little bit maybe under mix. And if you don't mix it enough, uh, you end up with something that is mushy and soft instead of, of having the elasticity that you need to build those layers. I remember when we were shooting uh, your class and it was, we shot in Brooklyn at the height of summer. It was very <laughs> hot. We didn't have any AC, if I'm remembering correctly. Yeah, and, and um, we were shooting the croissants in multiple phases. And remind me, I think that they were proofing too quickly because of the heat, right? That's right. So um, 
when I shot the masterclass, it was one of, one of my best experience, by the way, uh, with the, uh, the crew that is amazing. We had to turn everything off to, uh, for the audio. And I remember uh, having my croissant sitting on the counter. Of course, the AC was off, everything was off. And I could like almost see them like fermenting on my, like looking at it and they were puffing up and they were like changing, the volume was changing quite fast. So the heat is def definitely a factor that is important for the fermentation. The fermentation is essentially the, the process of uh, letting the dough uh, grow and, and almost double the volume uh, to make it light and aerated before you bake it. Are there, to that end, are there other variables outside of the ingredients and the technique that our home bakers should be aware of when they're making croissants? Things like outside temperature, humidity, oven calibration. Absolutely, that's what I said earlier. Like I won't get too nerdy, but humidity uh, and uh, humidity in the air is very important. Now, when you do fermentation in professional kitchen, we go around 80% humidity and uh, a room that is about 30 uh, to 32 degrees Celsius. Uh, so it's very specific. It's the optimal uh, temperature and humidity for fermentation. So a lot of factors can impact what you do and, and how you do it. And it, sometimes you don't have the, the right tools so you can have a different result. But I have to say this recipe works at home uh, for, for our croissant and uh, you can still get a, a pretty good result if you have the right ingredients. Okay, let's take a look at our next picture. We are moving on to one of my all time favorites, the Madeleines. <laughs> um, this is from Antoinette, whose 11 year old daughter made these. And her um, question is, she says they don't have a mini Madeleine pan, so they used a regular size one instead. How should the cooking time or temperature change for a regular size pan? And do these look like they're cooked long enough, too long, or are they just right? So this Madeleine's, I will say, uh, first, the beauty of the Madeleine, the most important part is what, what I call the little hump in the, in the middle of the Madeleine. So it has to be shaped like a, a hump in the middle. That's the batter with the shape of the Madeleine that is slightly uh, curved on the bottom. Uh, there's this extra batter that puffs up. That's the beauty of the Madeleine. I always call it the, the, the pearl of almost like a seashell, right? The, the view of the pearl in the center. Uh, this Madeleine looks uh, uh, golden uh, brown on the outside. It looks a little bit flat and uh, a little bit white in the center. I will say that I would probably have um, add a little bit more butter in this mold. Of course, uh, it also depends on the size. I would have, I would have add a little bit more butter and have uh, bake this a little higher temperature. So it really puffs up and you get a nice coloration. Uh, the out, outside uh, brown color, it's a little bit light. It should have been like a little bit, uh, a little bit deeper. It's but they look, they look not too bad. Yeah, they look pretty nice and made by an 11 year old, no less. It's pretty incredible. That's pretty nice. That's pretty good. Um, one, this reminds me that one of my uh, favorite lessons of yours from the class was the concept of time as an ingredient. Can you fill our viewers in on that a little? Absolutely. T time as an, ingredient, as an ingredient is very important for me. It's one of the quotes from, from my first book. Uh, time is very precious. Uh, for these madeleines, for example, we bake fresh baked madeleines in our bakery and we only serve them to order when people order them. And we ask, ask people to eat them immediately or within like minutes. And I always tell them that when they bite into the Madeleine, you have this, this last little puff steam coming out of the Madeleine. It's like the last breath of the Madeleine. And I always tell people they die young. It's uh, something that's alive. It's something that's so beautiful and so tasty when, when you eat them right away. And uh, I always tell people also, you know, like you have to compare, uh, compare it to like a sushi, for example. It's like if you go to a, sushi or makase or a chef, sushi chef, put sushi in front of you. You're not gonna wait 15, 20 minutes to eat it. There's a time, specific time where it's perfect, where it's really good. You know, like I love my sushi when the rice is still a little bit warm, when the fish is super, super cold. You have this contrast and it's, it's a perfect time to eat it. You have to eat it right away. Same a little bit with our madeleines. Uh, I don't like cold madeleines. I call madeleines uh, uh, for me, a little dry, um, they uh, you know they they don't taste as alive as the fresh baked madeleine, and they still 
okay, they're still good. They're not, they're not horrible, but I prefer my, my land to be like fresh back and eat it right away. It's a whole new experience that is hard to describe. My favorite part of, of the Madlands when I see people are coming to the bakery, ordering the Madlands, eating the first one and looking at the expression when they eat it. The eyes get wider. You see a smile on their face. They turn around and they share it with the people that they, they come with. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's a unique experience that uh, I grew up with, actually, like going to the bakery with my mom, my grandma, a few times a day, uh, having like fresh food out of the oven, fresh bread. It's uh, something that you remember, something that, that keeps you warm inside. A hundred percent. And I can personally attest to this, having had your Madeleines. I think I had a very similar experience. Your eyes kind of go back in your head. You're taken to another space for a moment. Um, and I think it's something that's important to mention about the Madeleines too, is that if you let them sit, they, they get like, they get hard very quickly, right? Exactly. So when they're fresh, they're moist, they're tender, they're hot. Uh, they, they would be perfect for me when to eat them. If you let them sit on the counter, they all get cold, they all get hot, and it's a different texture, it's a different experience. It's not as enjoyable. So eat your Madeleines right away. Um, okay, let's take a look at a cake. This looks pretty beautiful to me, I must say. It's very nice looking. Um, the question here is around how to frost the cake smoothly. Well, uh, I would say this, this cake is uh, actually, it looks pretty nice. Uh, how, the best way to uh, frost the cake smoothly, uh, one of my favorite techniques favorite technique is actually to use a bowl scraper and to put it on, on a spinning, spinning uh, cake stand and then you have a good consistency. Uh, you can also uh, use, uh, I like to use an offset spatula that I warm up slightly with a blowtorch. It's a little bit, a little bit technical, but you can put us under this. I warm up my spatula and with the heat of the spatula, it makes everything super smooth and super silky. <laughs> Given that I don't know how many people at home have a blowtorch, <laughs> is there anything <laughs> else they can use to- uh, You can heat it up. You can heat it up on the stove, just on the flame, very quickly. It has to be warm, actually. It shouldn't be hot. But it's a, one of the techniques that we use in the kitchen to actually make the frosting like super smooth without, without any holes, without any, any bump, without any, any difference of like thickness of frosting. Okay. This is from Aiden, by the way. And I personally have to say, I think Aiden did a wonderful job on that. Yeah. Um, okay. Our last one, and this speaks to the current and overwhelming bread baking craze that's going on <laughs> across the country and it seems like across the world. Um, this is a sourdough loaf from Lindsay. She says, I've been working on my sourdough for about six months now using the same recipe, but with different proof times. I still get similar results. Beautiful exterior and delicious taste, but slightly gummy and dense interior. What's going on? Uh once again, it's, I think it's a nice bread first. Uh, it looks pretty nice. Uh, there's a lot of things that can, uh, that can change the bread. Uh, you have to keep in mind that if it's a sourdough, we use a levain. Uh, it's something that is alive. Uh, it's very sensitive. Uh, the way you mix the dough is very important. The choice of flour is also very important. I would suggest her to maybe like use it, try a different type of flour to see if she gets a different result. Uh, but the, the shape, and the way it looks in the inside is very promising, actually. Uh, I would probably um, start in a hotter oven. Uh, as you can see, there's uh, the, the outside shell, the outside uh, uh, crust of the bread. It's uh, very light in color. I like my, my sourdough with a little bit more color on the outside and uh, to have a little bit more crust. And if you look at the bottom, it's a little bit uh, concave a little bit when you put the two pieces together. Uh, to put her bread on the, on the uh, cooling rack when it comes out of the oven so it doesn't steam from the bottom. That will help also a little bit. And to make sure that the levain that she uses is actually alive and fresh. And uh, that's, that's the heart of the bread. That's very important to, uh, to have a beautiful levain. Yeah, let's talk about that. You were kind enough to bake some sourdough to show to our viewers, right? Do you wanna hold it up and sort of talk <laughs> through what is going on there? So I have, uh, I cut it in half so you can see it. So that's the top of my sourdough. And here and inside, uh, you can see this uh, air pocket, those bubbles. 
is the foundation of the uh, the bread. Uh, you can look at the I look I was talking about the the crust. So from the bottom to the top, it's you see mine is much much darker. Uh, I like this crust. I think it's the flavor of the of the bread. And uh, you know if you tell a French person to eat uh, which which part they prefer of the the baguette, for example, if they prefer the center or the end. Most people like the end because it's crunchy, it has flavor, it has the, the crust, beautiful like uh, flavor, and that's the that's the beauty of it. So that's the sourdough that uh, I baked uh, this morning. Uh, we actually started to make uh, bread as well at the, at the bakery. Uh, we currently still open. Uh, we are uh, catering to our neighborhood and also doing a lot for for the hospital uh, to bring food to to hospital to support uh, the mini medical world. Uh, so this sourdough uh, started this weekend at the bakery and uh, it's been selling out very quickly. <laughs> we, we didn't make enough. It's wonderful to hear both that you are serving the community and that you've now introduced bread um, into your obra at the bakery. Given that you're not normally a bread baker, um, what have you found most challenging? Has there been a learning curve? I mean, definitely, yes. Uh, making bread is not easy. It's craft, it's a pure craft. It's a, a dedicated job. Uh, we, you need the right equipment, you need the right ingredients as, as usual, uh, and you need uh, to make sourdough a good levain. So the levain, I have one here for you actually. I bought my own levain. Uh, that I started uh, nine years ago, when I, before I even opened the bakery. So I kept it alive and it's normal to keep it that long and you refresh it every day. It's almost like, think about it like a rolling stock. They have, you have your base and you refresh it every day. So you have all the flavors, all the depth, all the, uh, the fermentation that you have that, that stays alive and that gives the flavor of the bread. So the levain is one of the most important part of the, uh, the sourdough. And uh, the levain is also what I use to make my croissant. So I have it right here. Yeah, show us. <laughs> I put it in the plastic container so you guys can see it. So you can see this micro bubble. It's actually the fermentation inside the the, the, the levain. So it's something that uh, that is alive. I always say it's alive. You have to keep it alive. I call it our babies uh, at the bakery. Uh, we have three different ones and they each have a different name. <laughs> they have different names for every location. Uh, in New York, they're quite simple. We give them letters. Uh, baby A, baby B, baby C, and baby D. In uh, uh, Los Angeles, they're a little bit fancier. They have baby uh, Cher, baby Beyonce. <laughs> and uh, uh, it's something that, that is important. They call babies because you have to take care of it every single day. You have to keep them alive. So you move part of it every day and you refresh it with more flour and water. This is very simple, but it's very important to keep alive. It starts with just flour and water and you let it ferment for a couple hours outside. Then you put it in the fridge next day, you take it out, you move a small part of it, you add more flour and water, you let it ferment and then you put it back in the fridge. So it's very, uh, you have to be disciplined into uh, keeping your lover alive. But once you have this, this is, this is gold. This is like everything, this is the heart of your bread. This is all the flavors and this is what's give, it's going to give you this beautiful bread. I mean, it's almost like a child to you at this point, no? It is, yes. <laughs> <laughs> which, one, which one is this starter? Who, who is this? This is Baby D. Baby D. <laughs> oh, the original, yeah? The original, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, so for those of you just joining, this is Masterclass Live. We are here with Chef Dominique Ansel, James Beard, two-time James Beard Award winner. Um, and he has been kind enough to be analyzing photos from our members of their baked goods. We have one more to show. This is of your most famous pastry and uh, one of your more advanced recipes, right? Which is the cronut. This is from Blade, who made this with a friend and just wants some general feedback. Ooh, that looks quite nice, actually. Uh, yeah. I can see uh, it's, it's, it's a little harder to tell because uh, this person took a bite out of it, but I can see the, uh, the separation of the layers within the inside. I can see this beautiful crust on the outside. It's golden, has a nice color. Uh, I would say that it looks actually quite nice. 
uh, that's uh, this person did a good job. It's not easy to make uh, bread and and dinosaurs and this all try the corner at home. Uh, for people that are successful, I would say they probably spend you know a good amount of time and research to get the right the right tools, the right ingredients to make to do a good job. But this is this is quite nice. I mean, like, are you giving Blade an A? I'll give him uh, probably an A minus. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to see this perfect cross section with all all these beautiful layers. It's not uh, it's not easy. It's not easy to do. That's that's very very nice. Yeah, it's pretty beautiful. I wonder what flavor it is. Can you you can't tell? Can you? I don't think this is flavored actually. I don't see any filling in there. Just classic. Um, okay, I want to move into some member questions. We got an overwhelming number. We got more than 500 submissions of questions and photos within like a few hours, which aside from indicating how popular you are, also indicates to me that there are so many variables to be considered when it comes to baking. And I wonder in the sort of perennial debate over whether baking is more art or more science, where do you stand? I think it's both. You have, it has to be both. Uh, baking is like for sure it's scientific you must be precise you must follow each of the recipe and it's there's a lot of rules there's a lot of uh, science going into it it's hard to break the rules uh, things work together for a certain reason and you have to understand the science behind it and then it's, it's odd because um, you can take just sugar flour and water and, and build a castle and build like beautiful showpiece and build things that look amazing from raw ingredients. And this, it's just like limitless for your creativity. And once you master the scientific part, you, which you have to learn, which is your foundation, you can be really artistic and explore uh, different culture, different approach, different ingredients. It's a, it's a life of learning. It's, a, it's really both that, that are combined together. Do you have a sense of what that moment is for our home bakers? Like, is there an indicator of like, okay, I've sort of mastered the technical basics enough that now I can sort of start playing around and, and having some fun? Yes, I think so. I think when you do something over and over and you feel good about it, you start experimenting, you start putting things together. And that's, that's probably like, the, that's the approach of my, my new cookbook. It's that there's like different section and people can mix and match things together. There's the base, uh, the filling and the finishes. And once you're comfortable enough to do each of them, you can start mix and matching things and making, making it your own with your preference of flavors, your preference of textures, your preference of finishing. So it's really like once you do it over and over again, you start feeling like you know what you're doing you know how it's gonna come out. And now you can start like playing with it a little bit more. And this to me feels like maybe where um, some someone's skills as a savory chef may come into play, right? Where all of a sudden now they get to start playing with like flavor pairings, they understand compositions of flavors together. It's like, then you can sort of borrow from your savory side. That's a very good uh, a question. I think that a good pastry chef is always a good chef. And once it's not just about making the recipes and, and knowing exactly how it's gonna work, it's also the taste and the flavors are very important. Mm -hmm. The seasonality is very important. Uh, knowing what to pair together and knowing that, you know, a little bit of fat works with a little bit of acid, uh, the contrast that matches together. Things like this, and if the best pastry chef I know are good chefs and, and love cooking. And I love cooking as much as I love baking. And I think it's uh, uh, they are two different way of approaching food, of like working with food, of seeing food, but they are uh, they're very complementary. And all the the best chef, savory chef I know, have a passion for for baking and and pastry, and and they know about it, they're interested about it. So it's like I will say that they're two different skills, but they're very complementary. Once you enjoy and appreciate both, you become a better chef altogether. That makes all the sense in the world to me. Um, okay, let's ask some member questions. 
This is a very timely one from Jake. He asks, uh, knowing that many people have limited access to grocery stores right now, if you had to pick one recipe that is the most versatile and uses easy to find ingredients that store for a long time, what would that recipe be? I will say uh, my banana bread recipe. <laughs> my banana bread recipe, it's so simple. Uh, it's uh, you need flour, sugar, uh, eggs, and uh, bananas, and a little bit of baking powder, and some simple ingredients that you can have at home. And uh, using over ripe bananas actually better. And uh, that's the, the base recipe that I actually use in my new cookbook again, uh, where I show people how to uh, using the same base and mixing other things like zucchinis, for example, in the bread instead of bananas, or adding uh, some something crunchy, some almonds, some. So you can have the same base, uh, having some, a very simple cake and turning into something something else. Or chocolate chips, my favorite. Chocolate chips, yes. also good. Um, <laughs> what do you think is the most common mistake that beginning bakers make at home? I think one of the most common mistakes probably uh, start baking without reading the recipe mm -hmm. and uh, not using the proper tools. I mean, a scale is very important or measuring cups. Make sure you're precise when you're measuring things. Uh, baking, again, is science. You cannot uh, cut corners. You cannot fast forward any step. Uh, you have to, to read the entire recipe and scale everything precisely. From there, if you do these two things, you have great chances of doing something good in the kitchen. Prep work, super important. Exactly. Mise en place. Yeah. <laughs> Plus. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have a flour question from Elizabeth. She says, I see a lot of recipes call for baker's flour, bread flour, semolina flour, etc. Why is it important to use specific flours when baking and can you mix different flours? So it's a, a tricky question to uh, respond. It really depends on what recipe you're working on. For example, if you're work on, working on bread or croissants, you're going to have to use a uh, baking flour, which is essentially a flour that has a little bit more gluten content inside. So you want a little bit of elasticity, you want a little bit of structure of foundation for the dough. If and you if, are- Sorry to cut you off there. If you do use a different kind of flour for a croissant, say, then what might happen to the final result? So if you use uh, like an all purpose flour, for example, you might have something doughy and bready instead of having some, something that has layers and, and body. Uh, the, the flavors will be different. The taste will be different. When you chew it, it's going to be uh, softer. So it's not going to be like an, an enjoyable experience for eating bread. If you do, let's say, uh, banana bread and you use uh, baking flour, uh, the, the flour might have a little bit too much uh, gluten content in the dough instead of using an all-purpose flour. And you might end up with something a little bit more chewy. So it's, uh, it changes depending on what you do, uh, on what recipe you're working on. I always suggest for people to, uh, to follow the instruction of the recipe. Uh, bakers always give recipes with uh, the, the specific flour, all-purpose flour, AP flour, or um, high gluten uh, content flour, uh, baking flour. And uh, just to use the right, the right flour for the right recipe. It, it changes all the time. And uh, sometimes from one brand to another as well, you can have a different uh, result. So if you have, let's say, uh, a baking flour, it can, it can be uh, more or less rich in gluten content. So you, sometimes you might want to try to use different brand to see if you have different results, like the sourdough we just looked at a few minutes ago. Okay. Are there any dishes that you know of where you can get away with using a different kind of flour? Uh, there's a few, uh, some, some simple one. Uh, like I think the banana bread again won't be affected as much if you use different type of flour uh, versus if you do bread or croissants, that will affect it a lot because you need this elasticity, you need this body to the, to, to the base to, to have this beautiful like layers and, and honeycomb. So if you don't use the right flour for lamination or for uh, for bread, it might be affecting your, your final product. Versus if you use the wrong flour for a banana bread, it's still gonna be okay. 
Speaking of, uh, we have another flower question, but this one is about alternative flowers. Obviously, we have a lot more people realizing that they might be sensitive to gluten. Um, Alex wants to know if you have any advice on how to bake with gluten-free flour. I've tried baking a few times with it, but the food tends to be dry and crumbly. I've experienced this as well. Is there a recommended technique or type of flour that works best? I haven't, uh, uh, I have worked only a little bit with uh, gluten-free flour and uh, we don't have uh, too many requests uh, in our shop actually because we have a lot of our recipes that don't contain flour on its own. We have a lot of uh, uh, gluten-free uh, cakes in our bakery and not because we purposely make it gluten-free because a lot of uh, French classic recipes that don't contain any flour. For example, uh, daquoise, which is a very moist cake will have an almond base and so there's no flour at all in in the, in that cake it's uh, moist it's tender it stays this way all the time and it naturally does not contain flour so there's a lot of recipes a lot of things that you can do without flour uh, for a specific bread uh, purpose I haven't done much baking with gluten-free flour but i know there's there's a lot more out there uh, I have friends that are gluten allergic and uh, they have a lot of options to, to buy bread, also to, to buy flour, uh, gluten-free flour. It does feel like the market has expanded and evolved in a, in a really profound way. I've been on and off gluten-free for almost 20 years. And in the beginning, the gluten-free products were like absolutely intolerable. Now you can get really good bread, but um, I have noticed I've never seen a gluten-free croissant. And I wonder if there's just like something that can't be replicated in the honeycomb. Uh, it's hard to tell. I haven't ex experimented too much with it. Uh, I, I will say that the simplicity and, and the beauty of, of, of a French classic like croissant stand by the flour that you use. Uh, the flour and the butter are two of the most important ingredients. So I'm sure there's something that eventually now or in the future that people will work on to get some similar results. But uh, it's still, you know, the classic and the authentic uh, French recipe is always always the best for me. If you Chef, can eat it, of course. Chef, I think if anyone's gonna figure out a gluten-free croissant, it's gonna be you. <laughs> I can figure it out. I can work on it maybe. Okay guys, you heard it here first. We're gonna hold <laughs> them to it. Um, okay, this is from Adrian. She asks, Creatively, when do you know if you're pursuing the wrong path or for that matter, the right one when you're developing a recipe? Do you have a gauge? I think that you, it depends. Like, I think you never know. You never know until you, you make it. And uh, when you work creatively, you always know what works, what doesn't. And when I work creatively myself, I always bend as much and, and, and stretch as much as I can to see how far I can push in terms of changing recipes, in terms of flavors of ingredients, in terms of ideas. I, I, I give myself no limit when I create. And uh, you know you have, when you, you have a good idea when you start testing it, you know it's gonna work pretty much like 80%. This other 20%, that's your march for like errors and, and tests and mistakes. So of course I've, I've been doing this for almost 30 years now. Uh, I didn't learn like the right away. Uh, it's, it's something that you have to practice, something you have to do over and over again. Uh, you know what you can tweak, you know what you can change. And I will say this like 20% of like margin for uh, errors and for tests, this is where you explore and where you push the boundaries of what you're supposed to do. Again, with science behind pastry, with the, being artistic and being creative, when you put those three together, it's very exciting. It's very exciting because you can do a lot of things that, that other people in other industry cannot do. And it's, it, it's fun because when you see it change, when you see it walk, you're like, that's it. Have, have a path and have a great idea. This has not been done before. This, of course, harkens back to the Krona, which you have said on a number of occasions, um, you were really surprised by the success of. Have there, on the flip side, been things that you thought would be hits that weren't? Uh, I never really work this way. I, I don't create to uh, uh, I don't create food to create hits. I create food because I want to connect with, with people. I want to, people to enjoy uh, the, the food. I want people to have memories of food. 
I want people to have emotions when they eat food. So it's not about creating the next next hit. It's about connecting with people. Uh, some things that I do that people absolutely love, and something that I, I do that people just like, but it doesn't <laughs> it doesn't go viral. You know what I mean? So it it's, it depends. It depends on people. It depends on on the, the taste. I always uh, create what I do for for people, uh, not for myself. So this this connection and how uh, you really understand people. The culture, the, the the flavor preference, the textures, the the idea behind it, the story behind what you do, like like the cornet was was simple. It was just another creation I put it on the menu for the weekend, and I still don't know how. I, I don't I still don't know. I'm not sure what happened. It went viral. It's a it's just a great idea, a simple product that people can visualize and people can understand very quickly, and that's the connection with people. We got a lot of questions from people wondering about the genesis of the idea for the Krona. Did you have an aha moment? How did it come to you? Uh, no, uh, <laughs> no, it was very simple. I was actually, I only had four employees when I created Krona. And uh, my fiance who started the bakery with me at the time, nine years ago, uh, told me that I should do something for a Mother's Day and maybe to do a donut. And look at her, I was like, hey, I have no recipes for donut. I'm French. <laughs> I don't know how to make a donut. She was like, well, do something. And I, of course, I grew up eating croissants. And I, I thought it could be cool to like work on something that is shaped like a donut that has the layers of the croissant inside. And I, actually, it took me more than three months to perfect the recipe. And at the time, it was something very simple. We tested it the day before. I remember a friend of ours, a blogger, came. I, snap a photo of it, he put it on his blog, and he called me uh, the same afternoon, told me that the article went viral. And uh, like I was telling you, I only had four employees. I was very tight, very small bakery with a tiny kitchen. I was exhausted, I was okay, long, long hours after talking to him, I was like, listen, I'm happy for you, I'm, I'm going to sleep. He's like, no, 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 you don't understand. He had an increase of traffic of 300% on his website and over 140,000 link to his article. And told me you went viral. You should make more tomorrow. I was like, fine, I'll make forty tomorrow. <laughs> and of course, by day three, we had over one hundred fifty people lining up outside of the bakery before we even opened the door. And this is when everything started, and it was just like overwhelming for myself and for my team. It was a, a stressful experience, <laughs> but it was, you know, looking back, it was beautiful, and it was like a simple product, a beautiful creation something that we maintain, we still now, they keep alive. We change the flavor every single month. We have never repeated, not a single time, uh, the same flavor in any of our location. It's uh, something unique and special that, uh, that, I, that, you know, that opened uh, many doors to our, our creativity. Yeah, I mean, your life just changes in virtually an instant. It completely changed everything. Uh, the beginning was very stressful. The, the staff was overwhelmed. Everybody wanted to quit. I had to do almost speeches, like war speeches to my, to my team in the morning to motivate them to open the doors because, of course, we, we couldn't make enough. People were not happy. We didn't have enough. And uh, we, a little by little, you know, a bit on hospitality, welcoming people with fresh baked madeleines, hot chocolate in the morning, and uh, slowly grew uh, what, what we're doing, keeping the quality and, and the consistency of, of our product and the uh, authenticity of it, which was one of the most important things for me. I can only imagine what it was like dealing with uh, disappointed customers who were being deprived <laughs> of their cronuts in the beginning. Boy. <laughs> um, where do you look for inspiration for your creations? Uh, inspiration comes from, a, from a, lot, a lot of different places. I will say travel for me is one of the, one of the best places. Uh, travel, learning about different food, of course, but not just food, different people, different culture, uh, different traditions. Uh, this inspired me a lot. Uh, I, I have a lot of like sources for, for inspiration. Uh, I look in, in, in a lot of different uh, world that are not connected with food. Fashions, one of them. I've looked into uh, nail art and old painting in the past. I've looked at pottery and the way to work with pottery. 
so all shapes, colors, movements. Uh, it's a, it's a wide world. It's uh, it's it's creative, and I, I don't think you should limit yourself to like what kind of food other people do, but more like how is this world of creative creative people, and how do they think? What do they see, and how do they see it through their eyes? And I've done a lot of things that that were inspired by movements, for example. We have a blossoming hot chocolate mm -hmm. uh, that is served uh, in you know, like chocolate cup that melts and opens up and shows, uh, reveal a flower, beautiful flower. So it's alive, it's in motion. And I got inspired by going to a museum and see, seeing a, a, a motion exhibit. So, you know, it can from, come from a lot of different places. It's just not, li just, not just limited to food or pastry. It's, uh, it's everything and everywhere. Well, and that's kind of the way that curiosity works, right? Like you explore things in all these different spheres and sometimes you're not even, I feel like you're sometimes not even consciously aware of how they're all gonna connect. And then there's this sort of aha moment where you make this connection and recognize how something that maybe you saw in a museum or the cherry blossoms in Japan might somehow apply to one of your dessert creations, right? That's true. A lot of things that I think you, you keep in the back of your mind and uh, come back in different form that can uh, show creativity, a shape, a color, uh, a movement, uh, flavor, a smell, like a, a feeling sometimes, like it can be a source mm -hmm. of inspiration. You just have to open yourself and uh, like I told you earlier, I don't have any limits. When I think of something new, there's no restriction of budget, tools, equipment, ingredients. It's just like, it's just all open. Of course, after that, we narrow it down to like what we, what is reasonable to do and uh, what, what we can do. But when I think creatively, I have zero limit. Go for it. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go back to some member questions. Um, we got so, so, so many questions about croissants, unsurprisingly, um, <clears throat> because they are not easy to make. Uh, Layla asks, whenever I make croissants, my butter seems to crack and break apart. I've tried to use higher fat butter and the butter eventually forms laminations, but they aren't perfect. What would you recommend? So I have, I've had this question a few times after, after the masterclass, uh, a few people brought up the same, uh, same question. Uh, the most important I will say for the butter is for the butter to be tempered. For the butter to be tempered, uh, it means that it should be a temperature of around 18 degrees Celsius. So it shouldn't come out of the fridge. You cannot take the butter off the fridge and put in your croissant. It will break for sure. It's too cold. Uh, you should leave it on your counter. And uh, I always tell people that also the butter should be malleable. So you should be able to take the, the, the square of butter and bend it into an arch. So once you're able to bend it, it's when the, the butter is actually ready. If it breaks or if it snaps, it's not, it's not quite ready. If the butter is too warm as well, it's not gonna work either. But for, usually for butter that breaks when you start the lamination, it's because it's too cold. Or it could also be that the butter is not a good quality butter. There are some butter on the market that contain uh, a lot of water inside. And uh, usually those tend to, uh, to, to break faster. You hear it sometimes you put some butter in, in the pan and you hear like popping a little bit. That's the, the butter that releases from, uh, from the, uh, the water releases from the butter and that mixes with the fat. So good quality butter, I always recommend an uh, 83, 84% butter. Uh, good quality butter is always better for uh, for your croissant. Okay. Um, this one relates to our earlier discussion about outside factors. Pablo lives in Ecuador and he wants to know what recommendations you have for baking at high altitudes. That's a really good question. I actually never bake in high altitudes. <laughs> I know that it's a lot different. There's a lot of things you cannot do. Um, and uh, I will be curious to try though. <laughs> I'll be curious to bake in high altitude. I never had to do this, but I'm sure s someday I will have to. Well, maybe we'll save that for our um, second masterclass live. Sounds good. <laughs> you're, you're gonna have tips on baking in high altitudes and you're gonna have a gluten-free croissant mastered for us that sounds very challenging for me but i'll take it but this is how you work right you like you that's like a challenge I, yeah. I love challenges i love challenges and you know that's what drives me i love doing things that are uh not common or not usual and uh 
I also love classics though. I love simple classical food, like a good croissant. Like a good croissant, nothing like it. Um, this question is from Michelle. She wants to know what advice you would give to a self-taught home baker who would love to turn their passion into a career. Um, that's another good question. I've had people in the past um, coming to uh, uh, talk and, and events that I was doing and after, after hearing me, they're like, oh, I'm so inspired. I want to become a chef. And I always tell them, do you like making one cake at home? Or how would you feel if you were making 300 cakes every day for 14 hours, 14, 15 hours, standing on your feet, walking every weekend? Would you still like it? So that's the question, right? You want to ask yourself, making work at home, it's nice. Making a every day for living is much, much harder. It's harder mentally, it's harder physically. And, uh, but you know, it's, it's not impossible that I know a lot of, uh, I've had some of my team members actually uh, came to the bakery with, uh, to me, to work for me with no experience in culinary uh, school, uh, with no training and actually did very, very good. A few of them, uh, if you're passionate, if you love baking, you just have to understand what it takes to become a professional chef, what it takes to uh, to work those long hours, what you sacrifice, because that's that's a big sacrifice to uh, leave a little bit behind your personal life, working every weekend, working overnight. It's it's hard. It's a tough industry. Uh, all the people that, that do it, they love it, they're passionate, and they don't see themselves doing anything else. Uh, that's why I love, I love, and I respect a lot all the bakers around the world. It's, uh, it's a tough industry, and uh, but you know they have they have big hearts. They uh, they love sharing. They love uh, bringing people together with food, and uh, that's what baking and, and and food is about. There's no real way to cut corners in this industry. You just have to yeah. put in work. Exactly. You you give your best, and you give all the time. You give to people. Uh, you give the best food, the best quality, the the best experience. And if you do the right, if you do it right, they come back to you. You know, I'd be remiss not to mention the hospitality industry, which has been hit acutely hard in this moment and in a really devastating way. But personally, I continue to be amazed by the ways that you and others in the community have mobilized and continue to serve communities, even in a moment when you are all struggling. And you touched on it earlier, but can you talk a little bit about what you're doing for medical personnel? Yes, exactly. So I've, I've decided to keep the bakery open um, for the simple reason that I didn't want to lose all my team and have to uh, fire everybody. It's a tough time. It's, uh, it's, it's hurtful for everybody. It's, uh, uh, you know, it pains me to, to, to have to let go of people. I decided to stay open uh, to provide for our staff to make sure that they can keep on living. Uh, a lot of people in our industry have been affected. I've been uh, just like business have shut down and closed for we don't know how long. Uh, we are still open. We are uh, delivering uh, food uh, through different apps and we're also catering to our neighborhood. It is great to see that uh, all the people that we used to uh, to see many years ago actually coming back and they see each other and sort of place where uh, they are uh, you find the same people uh, ordering the same thing. So it reminds me of my first day in the beginning. Uh, on top of this, we're also uh, helping the medical industry. Uh, they are the ones that need the most help and, and support and uh, anything we can do. Delivering breakfast, we've, we've done it from, for almost every hospital in New York City and uh, supporting people, put a smile on their face. They're doing the hard work. They're doing the toughest one. And uh, you know, if, if it's, um, takes for me to give and, and to be a part of it and to make these people feel a bit better. Uh, I'm glad to be a part of it. So we've been doing a lot of uh, charitable donation to hospital, to the team uh, from nurses, doctors, all the hospital uh, field. So I'm very, uh, very happy to be a part of it. It's beautiful to hear and I salute you. Um, I want to end with a final question from Samantha. She says, a silver lining of having to stay home is spiked creativity. Um, have you baked anything new since being quarantined that you wouldn't have thought up without having the time to slow down and think outside the box? Um, not quite, but I have, with all of this, uh, wanted to be able to stay connected with people uh, somehow. And 
you know, virtually with videos, uh, making videos. And I have done uh, quite a few videos lately. Uh, I've done the yoga cake, which is something I grew up with. I've done the banana bread and have a few more uh, that I'm working on as well. Uh, crepes, I've done crepes, simple crepes at home. A lot of those, those things I would have never done uh, without this situation. A lot of things that uh, uh, that I don't usually do every day, but it's, it's fun to bake at home. Uh, it's fun that uh, I'm able to actually do those uh, simple recipes and share with, with people. Before we wrap, tell us when your book comes out. So the book comes out on uh, April 14th, which is very soon. Amazing. I'm excited That's about it. It could not be coming out at a better moment, frankly. I think so. I was a little bit worried about releasing the book at this time, uh, but we decided to move forward because we had planned, we had worked on this book for the last two years. And I thanks my team again for uh, all the hard work we've they all, all been doing the, the, the last two years, working on this book from editing, photography, uh, from uh, helping me with the, the styling, the testing of the recipes. There's a whole team that worked on this, this book for a very long time. I'm excited to finally be able to, to release it. And I think it's also a good time that uh, people can, can stay home and bake from the book. Yeah, and I think we're learning in this moment in a really profound way that baking is a respite for people and it's bringing happiness into their homes and you're helping to provide that. I'm glad that I'm a part of bringing something nice. It's true that baking for me, it's, uh, it's very comforting. It's very uh, homey. It's uh, with your friends, with your family. It's uh, something that you can do together. That's something that, that is good too. That tastes good. And uh, that's, <laughs> that, yes. that is something, that's something important to, uh, to bring people together. A hundred percent. I want to thank you so much for being here today, Chef. And of course, thank you. Thank you. And to those of you at home, thank you so much for spending this hour with us. Our next Masterclass Live is this Wednesday with Dan Brown, who of course wrote The Da Vinci Code among so many other incredible novels. Um, and that will be moderated by my colleague and dear friend, Davis Carter. It will no doubt be amazing. In the interim, stay safe, stay sane, and keep baking. We'll see you next time.